I wear my hair in dreadlocks. I've nurtured them for one year, seven months, and 18 days. It's something I had been planning to do for a while now. See, for me, my dreadlocks serve as my connection to my Jamaican heritage, and also my mom, who's sitting right here in the front. But as I went along on my dreadlock journey, I came across a lot of people who told me if I ever wanted to work in corporate America, I would have to cut them. So as I started my junior year of college, began looking for internships, I had to face the question at hand, my hair or a potential job? So today I want to talk to you all about dreadlocks, my dreadlocks, and also the coded language behind them. But first, let's talk about some myths and set some facts straight. So, um, what are dreads? I heard you, like, don't wash your hair. <sighs> you probably smoke a lot of weed, right? That's why you have your hair like that, right? Yeah, man, I walk one. Your hair's like that because you're a Rastafarian. Ugh. The back of my hair, it, it feels disgusting. It feels like dreads. But, but you're great, though. These are some of the comments people have made to me at my time here at Brandeis on this campus. So, what are dreadlocks? What is a dreadlock? Well, essentially, a dreadlock is what happens when natural hair is left alone to grow on its own. It becomes tangled, matted in sections, and it will grow the way it wants. Essentially, a dreadlock is an encouraged section of knots that grow to form strands looking like yarn. If you look closely, a dreadlock resembles steel wool, a mass of fibers woven together in no particular order, order or form to form a solid object, as you can see. So for people whose identities are linked to the African diaspora, this happens pretty easily and naturally because of our hair texture and our hair type. But for other people with different hair type and texture or straighter hair, it becomes exponentially harder. But regardless, taking care of dreadlocks involves way more work than society cares to admit. Wash and retwist day, it's an extreme sport. Yes, I said wash day because people with dreadlocks wash their hair. How? Well, the same way as you all do with shampoo and water, I would hope. <laughs> and retwisting takes up a lot of time and a lot of hair products that take a nice, ch nice chunk out of my wallet and paycheck every month. So let's talk a little bit about the history behind dreadlocks. Dreadlocks can be found in all kinds of cultures all over the world, from people of color, anywhere from Ethiopia to India, but most people relate dreadlocks with Jamaica. So how did the two become synonymous? Well, the Jamaican political leader, Marcus Garvey, is often regarded as the leader of the Rastafari movement in Jamaica, which is an Africa-centric religion and ideology based on Garvey and the Abrahamic covenant of the Bible. Garvey once said, look to Africa for a black king, and he will be the redeemer. So many Rastafari believe this to be Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie I, but Selassie I himself doesn't see himself as a god or deity of any kind. The Bible also says Jesus will return as the Lion of Judah, so the Rastafari wear their hair in dreadlocks to resemble a lion's mane and also the return and coming of a great leader. But now we see dreadlocks becoming more popularized in the world, especially here in the U.S., and I would say that Bob Marley has a huge part to play in that. You see, when he became famous and internationalized, that bridged the gap between reggae music and the Rastafari, like Marley himself, with the rest of the world at large. So now I want to talk a little bit about the modern politics behind dreadlocks. So did you know it's legal here in the U.S. for a company to refuse to hire me because I have dreadlocks? Well, that's what the U.S. Court of Appeals ruled in 2016. They said, although hair is culturally associated with race, 
it's mutable, so you know, it's not really considered discriminatory for these practices. So in other words, because I can change my hair, it's legal and okay for you to discriminate me against it. And we see all kinds of instances in this, from the workplace to schools and even the military. So we can look at examples from 2010, where we see a young woman named Chastity Jones who lived in Alabama and had her job offer rescinded because she had dreadlocks. Let's fast forward a little bit to 2018. Six-year-old C.J. Stanley from Florida was sent home from his first day of first grade at his private Christian school because of his dreadlocks. We can also look to a more recent event in December of 2018, Andrew Johnson, a high school wrestler who was given an ultimatum at one of his wrestling matches. Either cut your hair or forfeit the match. He took the impromptu haircut, of course. In the video, you can see Johnson's trainer cutting away carelessly at his dreadlocks with a large pair of scissors. And on a more informal note and a personal note for me, my mom has told me multiple times about how she had to cut her own dreadlocks to ensure her employment here in the US. So why is this dreadlock discrimination even a thing? What's going on? Well, I'd say that it plays into a larger conversation about the politics of respectability, or respectability politics, which is a term known far too well to a bunch of racial and ethnic minorities here in the US, but at the world at large. It was a term coined by Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham in her book, The Righteous Discontent, The Women's Movement in the Black Baptist Church. The term was first used by Higginbotham to talk about black women and how they were trying to distance themselves from the stereotypes of the black community. Some of those stereotypes we can see as intellectual inferiority, immorality, violence, and laziness. So respectability politics comes into play especially for people of color, about how they have to adhere to societal s statistics and ideas of what it means to be respectable. As it relates to dreadlocks, we can look more into the workplace or schools where dreadlocks are deemed not professional or not respectable. And I think it's really important here to highlight that by following this logic, we're saying that black people are not respectable and not acceptable and not professional because of the way our hair naturally grows. And that's simply not the case. So after hearing all of that, it's not so far-fetched or crazy to understand why my parents wouldn't let me grow my hair out when I was younger. In elementary school, middle school, and high school, I was allowed maybe an inch of hair before I was taken into the kitchen for my own impromptu barbershop appointment with my dad and I hated every minute of it, every time. I found myself trying to hide from my parents, even wearing hoodies to hide my own hair growth so they wouldn't see how long my hair had actually gotten. But after a month or two, I was taken into the kitchen, my dad got the clippers, and I was bald again. And that same thing followed me here onto Brandeis' campus as my freshman and sophomore years they said, please cut your hair. And every barbershop appointment I went to, I would cut it all off because that's what they wanted. And now, as I went to my senior year of college, I began applying to different jobs at various companies around the world, trying to do big things with my life, of course. And I had to face the question again, what was I going to do about my hair? Every conversation with my parents went the same. It's, it's just hair. It'll, it'll grow back. But did I really want to work for a company that wasn't willing to accept my full self? And did I really want to change my identity and myself to fit another company's mold? So as I went to these different job fairs and job interviews, I found myself pulling my, pulling my hair back into the tightest possible ponytail so that people would focus on my face but not actually my hair. People will focus on what I'm saying, but not my hair. And I'm plagued with all kinds of thoughts and questions with every interaction I have. Do people think I'm lazy because of my hair? Do people think I'm dirty because they think I don't wash my hair? 
and please, please, please don't ask me if I smoke weed. But at the end of the day, none of that matters. Because I decide where, when, and how I choose to exist in this world, and the world has to adapt around that. Because that's genuine autonomy. So before I get off this platform, I want to leave you all with three things. The first of which is that dreadlocks are hair. They're a natural hairstyle, a normal hairstyle, just like the ones everyone in this room has. So get used to it. Normalize it. Get it in your headspace. The second thing is that I want each and every one of you to challenge yourself and challenge your ideas of what it means to be respectable. No, not just in terms of dreadlocks, but in terms of all kinds of external appearances, be them related to the society norms or not. These biases affect the lives of real life people. The city of New York is already doing that. They've already enacted a ban on hair discrimination in 2019. So I challenge each and every one of you to be forward thinking like the city of New York. And finally, I want to leave you with this. External appearance does not determine someone's ability to succeed in life. Be it your hair type, your skin color, or even your attire. Changeable or not, if it's a part of you, don't compromise. Be genuine, be your authentic self. That's what I'm learning to do more and more every day. So to all the people who judged me based on my hair, to my knowledge or not, thank you. You serve as my catalyst to my evolution of self. As Jay-Z once said in one of my favorite songs, Public Service Announcement from the Black Album, only God can judge me, so I'm gone. Either love me or leave me alone. Thank you. Welcome to my TED Talk. <laughs>